Welcome, everyone. We are delighted to have you here for the A4M Encore virtual event, where we will be sharing insights from our 30th annual Spring Congress, recently held in Hollywood, Florida, where over 2,000 physicians and professionals in the anti-aging industry gathered for this in-person event. We encourage you to use the chat to engage with your fellow attendees near the close of our sessions today. We'll have a short Q&A with two of our esteemed faculty, Drs. Erica Schwartz and Sahar Swedan. When the time comes, please enter any questions you have for them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand. You'll be able to access the program following the event by visiting a4m.com backslash webinar dash Wednesdays dot HTML. Now let's get started. We'll first hear a clip from the main stage speaker, Dr. Lee Frame, PhD and MHS. She is the co-founder and associate director of the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. Dr. Frame will share with us her knowledge of the immune system symphony and how vitamin A and zinc play an important role in the symphony. Okay, so first, we've all heard of immune boosting, and I want everyone here to never use that term ever again, because it's wrong. If we boost the immune system non-specifically, what do we have? Autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, that's not healthy, right? So we don't want to boost the immune system. Uh, and why is that? Because the immune system is not a single element. You don't just increase the immune system. It's a whole bunch of different elements. It's a symphony. So when we talked about the immune system historically, a lot of times we use this seesaw model. Th1 versus Th2, cell versus humoral, uh, intracellular versus extracellular, inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. Um, however, this is a much oversimplification uh, that was created before we had a lot of discoveries in the field of immunology. And this is what it looks like today. So you can see it is absolutely a symphony. Let me get my laser pointer out here. So if you look at uh, Th1, Th2, this is the classic example over here. Well, we've got all this additional part over here. Th17, Th9 are your inflammatory autoimmune. Treg is your sort of homeostasis and getting thing every, uh, down to the regulatory level. And then you've got your classic over here, which we can argue whether they're really truly inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. But really the point is there's so much more here than that, and you can't just boost all of these. That doesn't, that doesn't work. It's about a balance, a symphony between them. And now we're gonna talk about how nutrition plays in that. We're gonna start with vitamin A. So vitamin A is one of those unique nutrients that requires activation. Uh, so if you get beta carotene in your diet, you can't just use the beta carotene. It has to first be activated um, to retinol and then retinoic acid. So something to keep in mind as we think about vitamin A. When we talk about vitamin A and the immune system, we're talking really about two different things. So you have your endogenous retinoic acid, which is typically in low level, and your exogenous retinoic acid, which is often what we're delivering. So if we're delivering like a topical or something like that. And they have two very different effects on the immune system. And this is extremely classic. So when we talk about nutrition in the immune system, there's often dual effects, something that happens at a low level and something that happens at a high level, despite the fact that we're delivering the same thing. And so when we're talking about retinoic acid, it promotes Th1 differentiation, okay. Um, it's required for mucosal Th17 cells. And while we don't really want Th17 cells in large amount, we, we need them in some amounts. And the key here is really the mucosal because vitamin A is crucial for mucosal immunity. Vitamin A is actually the immune homing marker for the mucosa. Uh, and it's also really important for other basic immune functions. But when we go over here, if we're gonna deliver a large dose of retinoic acid, we're actually going to uh, decrease Th17 Again, decrease Th17 like cells and change the, uh, the hormonal milieu uh, in a way that's very different than that endogenous level. Now talking about vitamin A in the gut. So love the gut, really important. Vitamin A isn't just the mucosal home, home, immune homing marker, it's also the homing marker for the gut specifically. So there are large amounts of vitamin A in the gut saying immune system, this is the gut, act like you're in the gut. Um, and because of that, it's really critical for lymphocyte and development. 
And when we talk about the gut, we talk about myeloid cells and vitamin A. And what do we have here? So we're getting the vitamin A out of the diet. It's going to affect the microbiome. We're going to get it across the gut barrier. And then it's going to be bound and brought to the myeloid cells. And the myeloid cells are actually going to be activating from retinol to retinoic acid. So without the myeloid cells, we don't have activated vitamin A. It can't really do anything. Um, and, but once it's activated, then it's going to alter the T and B cells. So there's a whole symphony here, too. Again, what, what uh, Dr. Hayden was talking about, the system of systems. It's not any one element that's really crucial. Um, but what happens when we have that alteration, it's actually altering the gene expression. So going back to the orchestra example, you have these genes, and then the way vitamin A works with them is going to alter how the music that is played. Also, vitamin A is really crucial for gut barrier function. Um, I, I think you know it's an immune homing marker by this point. <laughs> um, but just to drive that point home, uh, if you have a healthy gut with enough vitamin A, you have a, a quote unquote healthy gut microbiome, and you're going to have an immune response that is pretty typical, meaning this is a homeostatic response with immune surveillance. So it's out there looking to see if there's a problem, but it's not necessarily reacting. Uh, but if you have vitamin A deficiency, you have altered gut microbiome, you're going to have inflammation, and you have um, an overreaction in terms of Th1 and Th17. So what does that mean? That means a lot of inflammation. So if we don't have enough vitamin A, we have a lot of inflammation in the gut. Another really important thing about vitamin A, it's a really complicated molecule. It's an acute phase reactant. So what does acute phase reactant mean? It means that when there's inflammation, it is knocked down. And it's typically not actually removed. It's stored in the, litter, the liver. It's sequestered in the liver. So if you were to look at a patient's retinal status when they're normal, here's where it would be. Now, if they get an infection, it's going to come down all the way here during this high acute inflammation. And then as they get better, it will slowly shift back. But it's not that they're vitamin A deficient. It's an apparent deficiency. It looks as if they're vitamin A deficient. And you can actually alter their, their measurements by looking at how much inflammation they have. And there are some, some calculations for doing that. But it's a little bit tricky. So in summary, vitamin A, it's crucial for the maintenance of immune response, particularly in the mucosa. It's important for eyes. We talk about night blindness when we talk about the eyes. It's important for the gut, so prevention of leaky gut. It's important for the microbiome to have that appropriate immune response and to, uh, to really maintain its ecosystem. Uh, deficiencies are really uncommon in developed countries, frank deficiencies, that is, um, but extremely common in uh, developing countries, a very high burden. Uh, and then also measuring them can be a little tricky because of the inflammation that reduces the apparent status. Okay, zinc, another really important nutrient. When I think about zinc, I think about zinc fingers. And zinc fingers are required for gene expression. And so if zinc is required for all gene expression, you could see where zinc plays a really important role. But to point out a few uh, really important ones in particular, keratinocytes, uh, epithelial cells, myoblasts, um, and adipogenesis, all of that requires zinc fingers. It's also really important for cancer biology. And it's important for proliferation and migration, invasion, as well as metastasis. So no zinc, uh, no expression of these cancer genes. It's also been indicated in certain diseases. So zinc's important for uh, Parkinson's disease, psoriasis, neonatal diabetes, congenital heart disease. Really, you could see zinc's important for gene expression. It's really important for almost everything. So if we were to look at zinc deficiency in a specific instance, let's look at autoimmunity. So in a systematic review and meta-analysis, 62 studies looked at zinc concentration in the serum and plasma. And they found significantly lower zinc concentrations in those with autoimmunity versus those that, that were controls. And despite the large variety of study designs and populations, this was extremely consistent. So there's something here. But because it's a cross-sectional study, we can't really say if it's cause or consequence of inflammation. So let's look at some of the immunological literature. So we know that zinc is important for, uh, for T and B cell maturation, and deficiency leads to an improper function of these cells. It also is involved in immune skewing. And when I talked about that C cell model as being incorrect, there are other people out there who are trying to make visualizations that are a little bit more correct. And I would say this is more correct, but still not 100% there. So take it with a grain of salt. But as you can see, in, in, in 
patients who have zinc, you have a pretty well-balanced response. And then when you have zinc depletion, it's shifting that response. And that has nothing to do with the, the correct immune response. It has nothing to do with you have a bacterial or a viral infection. This is just due to the zinc depletion. And what happens is it skews away from a Th1, Th reg. So that's what we typically think as being kind of our homeostasis. Uh, and then it reduces activity of natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. So if you need a response, that's not good. And it also changes our reaction with a Th17 and Th2. So Th2 is shown to be roughly maintained, or some of those cytokines are actually increased in zinc deficiency. And then Th17, zinc actually inhibits the production of Th17 cytokines. So if you have zinc de deficiency, you're more likely to have Th17 response, which we know now to be an autoimmune response. And it's actually a very similar response to that of LPS, which you've also probably heard a lot about, particularly when we're talking about gut health and leaky, leaky gut. If you have a response to LPS, you can have these broad inflammatory and autoimmune reactions, and that's because it's a very similar response to a Th17 response. Also, zinc deficiency is very similar to aging. So if we look at the column here, this is what aging looks like, this is what autoimmunity looks like, and they're very similar. Uh, you talk about T cell hypomethylization, chronic inflammation, accumulation of T cells, uh, not, uh, autoantibodies, shortening of telomeres, increased risk of chronic inflammation associated diseases like obesity, heart disease, cancers, and then systemic or mucosal inflammation. But the real, the key difference here is you have an increased regulatory T cell function in aging, so that actually knocks down your immune response, and you have an impaired regulatory T cell function in autoimmunity, which means it doesn't knock down that response. So you have this rampant, here we can use immune boosting, right? That is immune boosting, we don't want that. And so here's my model for zinc homeostasis. So as zinc status goes up, inflammation goes down. This is generally gonna be a response below toxicity. So as with all things in nutrition, there's kind of a sweet spot where you want to be. And as you get to a too high a level, the relationship changes. So we don't want super high zinc levels, but within that sweet spot, this will be the relationship. Zinc's also an acute phase reactant. And uh, here's a different way of looking at what an acute phase reactant is. So if you have a pathogen, uh, you have increased production of inflammatory cytokines, which cause upregulation of zinc import proteins in the liver. So that's why zinc's being pulled into the liver. That's an acute phase reactant. Uh, and the same thing is happening with vitamin A. Zinc is really important in wound healing. And I love this graphic because it really shows how it's important throughout the stages of wound healing. So right at the beginning with platelet activation, all the way down to remodeling and scarification. And it's, it's really important and it's, it's we, we, we know this and we understand this in the use of zinc oxide. So zinc oxide is in all sorts of topical creams, right? Di diaper or adult barrier cream, medicated foot powder, mineral sunscreen. Now there's a thought. Maybe this is another argument for why mineral sunscreen is far better than chemical sunscreen. Um, and, but interestingly, it doesn't respond in other ways. So topical zinc sulfate doesn't seem to be beneficial. And then oral supplementation, also not beneficial, likely because of the dose because dose is extremely important when we're talking about nutrition in general, but especially when we're talking about nutritional immunology. Like I showed you with retinoic acid, right? Low levels are very different than high levels. So summary for zinc, crucial for immune homeostasis. Deficiency prevents a Th1 response when necessary, and it skews towards autoimmunity. And it's similar to immune senescence, which is what we, we would call aging. Uh, however, it has hyperreactive components. So it's like the worst of aging and then some. And it's also an acute phase reactant. Uh, but what's really important, we're talking about autoimmunity and zinc, is that it's an important part of immune education. And so zinc is really important in childhood, and early screening is going to be important because of that. And this is something that I think most people are not thinking about when they're thinking about childhood. That was very informative. There's more to learn from her complete session featuring the valuable roles of iron, vitamin D, and how carbohydrates, proteins, and fat are required fuel for immune function. If you want to hear Dr. Frame's complete on-demand session, as with all of our session speakers we are featuring today, visit our library and purchase our Spring Congress All Access Pass. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Nathan Bryan, a renowned researcher in nitric oxide and successful entrepreneur who is the holder of numerous patents. 
we're sharing the first portion of a session where he defines female sexual arousal disorder for us. So today we're going to talk about female sexual arousal disorder, but please understand that as we look at that particular vascular bed, this can, this can relate to anything. If you have vascular dysfunction in the sex organs, you have vascular dysfunction in the coronary arteries, in the cerebral arteries, in every blood vessel that perfuses every single organ, tissue, and cell in the body. So if you have sexual dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction in the pelvic region, that's a sign and symptom of systemic disease. So where we're gonna focus on female sexual arousal disorder, please understand that this relates to any vascular bed. So we'll define that. I'll instruct you how, to, um, how nitric oxide is involved in the regulation of blood flow, and really hope to share with you some simple things, some lifestyle strategies that you can either do or stop doing that are, we've shown clinically to prevent nitric oxide production. And then at the very end, I'll take you through some, some uh, peer-reviewed uh, placebo-controlled clinical trials where we've utilized our nitric oxide technology in a number of different complex clinical situations. But I'm a basic scientist, and so my job is to give you clinicians the tools to treat, diagnose, prevent uh, chronic disease. And that requires us to see what everyone else has seen, but to think what no one else has thought. And I'll have, in, in the next half hour or so, I'll take you through some of those similar experiments where we go, had the aha moment, goes, okay, this changes everything. So if we define what we're talking about today, it's female sexual disorder. You know, a lot of emphasis is put on men with erectile dysfunction and the females kind of been ignored, but it's the persistent recurring decrease in sexual desire or arousal, diminished lubrication, difficulty or even inability to achieve an orgasm or feeling of pain during intercourse. And this is very prevalent. If you look back over history in the 1970s, uh, the so-called sexual revolution, 76% of women reported some symptom of sexual dysfunction. And even in the newest literature, you see a wide range from 18 to 76% report some form of inhibited orgasms in, in a clinical setting. So these are people who actually go to the physician and report that. I think the numbers are probably higher because most women aren't going um, to seek some form of treatment for this. So what we do in the basic sciences is we understand the mechanism of disease to the extent that we can then employ safe and effective therapeutic strategies to get to the root cause of the dysfunction. So if we look at the mechanism of sexual arousal or orgasm in women, this requires an increase in vaginal blood flow. And then this leads to an increase in clitoral engorgement, label engorgement, and vestibular bulb engorgement. But as you can see there, all of this is dependent upon increase in blood flow. And these are the hemodynamics of what happens. Um, and so you can see when you start to get arousal, there's an increase in labial pressure, vaginal pressure, that pressure is due to an increase in blood flow or an engorgement in the pelvic region. But the problem is if you can't increase blood flow because you can't make nitric oxide in a particular vascular bed, you don't get an increase in blood flow, you don't get an increase in pressure, and you become anorgasmic. So just like any other chronic disease, sexual dysfunction is a disease or a symptom of insufficient nitric oxide production and what we call endothelial dysfunction. And men, we're very simple organisms, right? If we just increase blood flow, we can increase sexual function. Women are a little bit more complex organisms because it's, it's a complex neurovascular process that's controlled by many inputs. It's anatomical, it's hormonal, neurological, psychological, physiological, and social and interpersonal. And this is the anatomy, obviously, most of you are familiar with, but this is what you have to regulate blood flow and push blood flow to the pelvic region to increase pressure in this. And again, the anatomy is a little bit different in men and women, but the underlying physiology is exactly the same. And this is controlled by uh, cell signaling. And so this particular region, whether it's the penis or the clitoris, it's innervated by non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerve endings, and it's lined, all the blood vessels are lined with endothelial cells. So when we start to get arousal, that tells these non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerve endings to generate nitric oxide gas, that leads to an activation of uh, or binds to soluble guanylate cyclase. And then that enzyme converts GTP into cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP is the second messenger that's responsible for the calcium dependent, smooth muscle relaxation, vasodilation, and engorgement. So 
again, this is dependent upon an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase, and if that enzyme is uncoupled, you can activate and stimulate till the cows come home, but again, you're not going to get any nitric oxide out at the other end. And there's a clear correlation between sexual dysfunction in both men and women and certain chronic diseases. But in this particular study, it was compensated heart failure. So 87% of middle-aged women with heart failure reported some degree of sexual dysfunction. And it's linked to cardiovascular disease in both men and women. So if you have sexual dysfunction, it puts you at an increased risk for atherosclerosis, peripheral artery disease, and even high blood pressure. So treating sexual dysfunction in both men and women purely as a lifestyle disorder severely underestimates the seriousness of disorder. Because again, if you have endothelial dysfunction in the pelvic region, you have endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries in every vascular bed throughout the, the body. And that's why we call this the canary in the coal mine, because it's really the first sign and symptom of nitric oxide deficiency and endothelial dysfunction. And they all converge on nitric oxide. So whether it's the psychological input, the non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic uh, nerve endings, or hormones, estrogen activates and stimulates nitric oxide production. But all of this is dependent upon the activity and function of the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. And as I'll show you, the people with, whether it's endothelial dysfunction or sexual dysfunction, the NOS enzyme is uncoupled, so you can give activators or stimulators all day long, but again, there's gonna be no nitric oxide come out at the other end. So the problem in all this, you can fix hormones, you can do bioidentical hormone replacement, you can fix the psychological, neurological, but until you fix the physiological input of this, which is the function of nitric oxide synthase enzyme, you're never gonna get an improvement in sexual dysfunction. And I think this has been the missing piece in hormone replacement, because you lose the cardioprotective benefits of hormone replacement unless you restore the function of nitric oxide synthase. So the point of this is the root cause of sexual dysfunction in men and women is endothelial dysfunction. It's the loss of nitric oxide and the inability to regulate blood flow to the genitalia. And again, if you're, if you're an athlete and you're on a treadmill and you try to increase the workload of the heart, if you can't dilate the coronary arteries with nitric oxide, you fail the exercise stress test. If you want to recall memory of where you left your keys, you have to increase blood flow to certain regions of the brain. If you can't, you develop mild cognitive disorders. If not corrected, you get vascular dementia. If not corrected, you get Alzheimer's. And it's the same in every single organ that we look at. And one of the cool things now with these new imaging modalities is you can look inside the body and see what's happening with non-invasive imaging. You can do this with angiograms and the coronary arteries, but most of you are familiar with Daniel Amen's work where he uses spec scans to look at the perfusion of the entire brain. So any neurological condition is characterized by loss of regulation of blood flow to certain regions of the brain. And you can see here that on the left here is a healthy brain, so it's nicely contoured, meaning you're getting sufficient perfusion of all regions of the brain. And this is a female here with um, depression, uh, addictive disorders that develop sexual dysfunction. And you can see here these holes in the brain are reflective of insufficient perfusion or blood flow to the brain. This is the same in bipolar, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, any neurological condition. You see different regions of hypoperfusion in different regions of the brain based on the neurological symptoms. So this is kind of the, the take-home slide. If you remember nothing more than this slide here, it's that nitric oxide deficiency causes sexual dysfunction. It causes chronic disease and increases sickness and mortality from viral infection, including coronavirus. And I don't have time to go into it today, but we have a drug in phase three clinical trials for COVID in at-risk populations that we're seeing. If we can titrate up their nitric oxide levels, you can get exposed to COVID, but we keep you out of the hospital. We keep your blood oxygen saturation up. We keep you off a vent. And if we keep people off ventilators, we keep them alive. Now remember that you can visit our Spring Congress All Access Pass if you want to view the complete session and learn more about his research and therapies. Our next session highlight comes from Dr. Felice Gersh. She's an award-winning certified integrative OBGYN physician. We catch up with her midway through her session on women, hormones, and health, where she shares her insights on the gut microbiome estrogen access. Let's watch.
So let's touch now on this area that I told you estrogen has receptors in the gut. You know those lining cells? Yes, they all have receptors. How about the other layers of the gut? The enteric nervous system. They call it the second brain? Yes, all of the cells. How about the immune system of the gut? They have their own microglia. Yes, they all have estrogen receptors. Now, we want to have a healthy gut. You all know that. That means we don't want to have the wrong microbiome, that collection of trillions of microbes we did not know about until relatively recently. So not knowing about them, what have we done to them? Tortured them, starved them, killed them, and we did not know that there are best buddies in there. Would you do that to your pets? I think of them as my trillions of pets. I want to take care of them. And when we take care of them, we have proper function of T regulatory cells. You know those specialized lymphocytes, the T reg cells? I consider them the peacemakers of the body, of the immune system, to keep things proper so we don't have like autoimmune disease, we don't have crazy inflammation. But when we have dysbiosis in the gut, what do we get? We get impaired gut barrier, known as leaky gut, and we get inflammation. And inflammation underlies all of the chronic diseases we associate with aging. But is it really aging? Is it chronological age or biological age? Because we are not healthy inside, including our gut. So what causes gut dysbiosis, an abnormal gut microbiome? Well, you've probably seen many of these things listed. You know, your genetics, antibiotic use, which by the way, you know what? There's a big epidemic of gut cancer, colon cancer, increasing dramatically in young aged people. They've now linked that to excessive antibiotic exposure in childhood. The gut microbiome matters for everything. And so we know antibiotics, lifestyle, stress, the mode of delivery like C-section, if the baby was breastfed. But you know what almost never gets discussed? Estrogen. Why is that? Well, never again, anyone in this room who talks about the gut, gut health, healthy gut microbiome, estrogen will always be on your radar, right? Because estrogen is a critical component of maintaining a healthy gut microbiome. In fact, the gut microbiome is so heavily interlinked with estrogen that there are unique microbes in the gut designed to interact with conjugated estrogens. They were conjugated in the liver. You've heard about that sort of thing? That estrogen goes to the liver, it gets conjugated, it goes down the trash chute. You know what the trash chute is? The bile duct. Yeah, the bile duct. And then it goes into the intestine. Well, there are specialized microbes, but only if we nurture them to be there, right? to actually work on these conjugated estrogens. And when you have the wrong gut microbes and you have dysbiosis, look at what this shows. You end up at a higher rate of, and they've linked this to endometriosis, PCOS. In fact, I was involved with another researcher and we were trying to get a first paper out on dysbiosis in women with PCOS. But guess who beat us? the Chinese, and it was funded by the government because PCOS is at epidemic levels now in China. And obesity, metabolic syndrome, cancers, brain health, all of these are involved with these specialized microbes. And they gave a special name to this microbial population, the estrobolome. Isn't that amazing that estrogen is recognized evolutionarily to be so important that there are distinct microbes just designed to work with estrogen. And I put this slide in to show you that, remember it said that when you have a dysbiotic gut microbiome, you end up with inflammation. And I said inflammation underlies all of the diseases that we associate with aging, but it's not just aging anymore. We are young and sick. Right? So someone coined this term, metaflamaging. I love that. 
metabolic dysfunction leading to chronic low systemic levels of inflammation and aging. But aging is not essentially going to give you inflammation if we take the right steps. At least we can lower it. We can slow the progress of the inexorable process called aging. And here it just shows when you have inflammation and the immune cells permeate the inflammatory visceral fat and it creates this sequence of events that involves every organ system. That's why I get so crazy when I read these reports. Guess what we just discovered? There's an increased incidence of dementia in women who have osteoporosis. It's like, duh, osteoporosis is in pro-inflammatory state, so is dementia, neuroinflammation. And then likewise, you know, I'll say, we just discovered that women with cardiovascular disease are more likely you know, to have some other pro-inflammatory thing, like, or they could say dementia or osteoporosis, because it's one body. Look at all these organ systems. They're all interlinked with inflammation and creating harm. And it links tremendously to the gut microbiome, which links tremendously to estrogen. Dr. Gersh's complete session summarizes that to help patients regulate their hormones, you should one, feed the gut microbiome, two, consume phytoestrogens, three, consume dietary nitrates and vegetables, and four, align with circadian rhythms. Now remember, you can access her complete session in our Spring Congress All Access Pass, and you can see that link on your screen. At each A4M Spring Congress, the exhibit hall is always buzzing. So let's take a look and visit with some of our exhibiting companies. So we are a medical outcome tracking company, patient reported outcomes. So it measures patients' symptoms or quality of life burden before they're treated, and then keeps track of them with a fitness tracker-like experience for the patient they can see how they change over time as a result of all of the various treatments that they may undergo. Thank you. And that data wraps up, informs decisions, helps the provider market themselves, and has just incredible benefits to the whole system. The data, in addition to enhancing the patient experience and really connecting the provider and the patient together throughout the journey with a unified goal of trying to get that patient to have a better quality of life and have fewer symptoms in a really transparent, beautiful way, the data wraps up into a dashboard where the provider can actually see what's working and what's not working specific to certain patients so you can get precise with precision medicine. And you can also start to figure out things that you can't necessarily know unless you have a tool to be able to analyze what's worked and what's not worked. It's called dialing in best practices. With that data, um, you can actually figure out, oh, actually when a patient's in this age range and has these comorbidities and has this history or this confounding factor, which we also track and structure data around, this adverse event in their life, we find that they do best with that treatment. And when they have this other process, similar patients but a little different, the smoker versus the non-smoker, this is the best way to go. And that level of understanding is what guides best health and maintains people over time the best. Most people know more about the gastrointestinal microbiome than they do about the microbiome, all of the different microbiomes that exist. So there's a different ecological niche and all over the body. We have a microbiome in our ears, in our mouth, in our sinuses, in our lungs. We even have a microbiome on our skin. Um, so it's true that most of the microbiome is housed inside the gastrointestinal tract. We have trillions of microorganisms there, but we do have a microbiome everywhere on the body, basically, and it can be worked with to help affect change and healing for, for our patients. Balancing the microbiome helps with overall health because we have microorganisms everywhere through the whole body, and there are lots of different reasons why they can we can lose balance in the microbiome or that micro, the microbiome can start to affect our, our health in in basic ways. So helping to balance whether it's in the oral microbiome or in the gastrointestinal microbiome, whether it's in the skin, uh, whether it's in the sinuses, all of those things uh, can really help to affect change. And when you're working with an antimicrobial like biocidin or something a, bi a botanical like biocidin, then you select your, your 
your delivery system based on your target, right? So is it the middle ear? Uh, is it the skin? Is it the gut? And then we have a way with the botanicals to work with all of those different microbiomes. Pictured here, my biotonic. This is our nightshade free adaptogenic tonic. And I love this product because I tend to be more in that sort of sympathetic fight or flight response. And, and it's not unique to me. So many people are typically in that, especially in today's day and age. Um, and so we've got some amazing adaptogens in here in the form of ginseng, licorice, and also um, astragalus. And so that's gonna help kind of modulate that stress response and keep you in that nice place of homeostasis and balance. So really a great product to just bring on board anytime you're feeling a little anxiety, a little stress, but also simultaneously, if you are feeling a little fatigued, it's a great product to help kind of bring up a little bit of that energy and bring you back into that great place of, of homeostasis. In addition to that, it's also going to be great for immune support. We've got astragalus in there as well as codenopsis, and those two combined are really going to be great for helping with that adaptive and um, innate immune system. So really great for immune support. And then finally, what I love about this product is it, it acts as a digestive bitter. So we've got some ginger in there. There's also some tangerine rind and even a little turmeric. So really going to help aid in that digestive aspect. So all those things really make this a really well-rounded product and one of my favorites. So Berkey Life is a company entirely focused on the science of nitric oxide. So we've had a nitric oxide capsule on the market now since 2017 in combination with the diagnostic test strips that we have. Here at A4M we're debuting the Berkey Life line of Dr. Nathan Bryan's uh, nitric oxide skincare line. So what we're adding to our product line is a topical nitric oxide product. So that complements our systemic nitric oxide you get from our current capsule with a localized topical application. For us, it's a fantastic way to meet the practitioners that are most accepting and most understanding of the science that we're bringing to the table. So everyone that comes to this conference, I feel, is looking for the latest in functional medicine, integrative medicine that is going to help their patients overall. So for us, it's an easy way to come to one location, meet the, you know, the practitioners that are interested in what we're offering in a two, three day event. Genova is the industry leader in specialty laboratory testing. We've been around for 40 years and have been leading the way with the most innovative ways to diagnose root cause problems in patients. So um, basically, if a patient presents with symptoms, we're going to do diagnostic testing to evaluate a number of different factors in the patient's body to ensure that we can get to the root cause of what's causing those symptoms. It's personalized medicine, so it's very unique to each individual patient which allows the physician to optimize outcomes for those patients and truly, truly treat each patient as an individual. The value for Genova is exponential because of the fact that these physicians are leading the way with regards to true preventative medicine. So not the healthcare system that we have currently, which is basically diagnosis, disease care, it's actual prevention. So different ways that you can anti-age, different ways that you can optimize your health, and it's important for Genova to be able to provide these resources, not only to the physicians here, but for the physicians to carry it to their patients. It's always great to hear from our exhibitors. Next up is a speaker most of you know well, Dr. Thomas Gilliams, PhD. He is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin and the founder and director of the Point Institute. Today, he challenges us to look at the HPA access and to think beyond the stress response. So if you think of the stress response or the HPA axis, this is sort of a summary. I'm going to talk about it at the end as well. The stress response needs to respond to homeostatic metabolic needs. So energy needs. If you're hypoglycemic, your, your, your HPA axis will turn on. If you have inflammation, it's strong HPA axis stimulant. Metabolic dysregulation, circadian disruption. All of these are going to be responsive. If the brain or the hypothalamus perceives any imbalance in one of these areas, it's going to respond. You also have higher orders of the brain that allow you to anticipate stress. So psychosocial anticipation of dysregulation. I think something is going to happen. Um, circadian anticipation. This is something that we're going to talk about here because it's really important. Not only do you have 
um, you know, you know or you believe certain things are going to happen, so you're getting yourself ready for the stress response. But your body is gearing up this, the HPA axis throughout the day at a, in a circadian way. Um, I guess Felice kind of set me up for that. And then this is another area which we don't have time to get into, but the HPA axis is also remembering. It's adapting to all prior events that have occurred, that occurred metabolically, that have occurred from a stress response standpoint. That includes early life stress, cortisol sensitivity changing, feedback loops. There's epigenetic changes in, in all the pathways that, that I'm gonna talk about. There are things called chaperones, heat shock proteins, et cetera, that are involved in this that are also modulated. Neurosteroids, uh, you make DHEA, you make uh, pregnenolone in the brain, and then learned responses, things that, you, things that you grew up doing and the way that you adapt to stress. So this is your HPA axis. It needs to deal with things that are happening now. It tries to uh, anticipate things that are going to happen, and it's influenced by all of the history of those responses, often down-regulating them, as we see in, in PTSD, et cetera. So this is the wheel that I typically use. I, this is, again, what I, what I developed this and, and teach using this. So you can see that the main stressors of the brain fall in basically four categories circadian disruption, inflammatory signals, glycemic dysregulation. And you can see up on the right-hand side, all of those are those direct homeostatic signals that are responsive, meaning once the signal comes to the brain, it tries to respond to those three factors. In the upper left-hand corner, these are, these are indirect, I would say filtered psychological signals. They're filtered through neurosteroid signals, uh, neurochemical signals, neuroendocrine signals. And all of those are things you can see, these are the anticipation. My finances, right now, many of you are thinking about things you have to do at home instead of being here. These are all stressing you out, um, and you're listening to me. Um, and so all of these, these are anticipatory. And so your brain needs to take all that information, and then it needs to send a series of signals to the rest of the body to say, okay, physiologically deal with this. Okay, deal with this in a physiological manner. So another term that you probably heard of is allostatic load. This is a, essentially a term Bruce McEwen coined to give the idea of how the, the, all of these loads come together. This is something I want you to think about. This is an interesting definition of allostatic load. It is the metabolic cost of reestablishing physiological integrity after a stressor. So every time you have a stressor and your body needs to get back to dealing with the next stressor, it has a physiological cost, a metabolic cost to get you back to that stage. What is that cost? And if that cost keeps getting larger and larger and larger, it's going to start consuming the buffer that you have to do other metabolic activities, okay? So that's a really important idea because as we're gonna see here, the HPA axis is not ultimately, we should not ultimately think about it as a stress response system. We're gonna see in a minute what that is. So, as most of you know, the adrenals respond to the brain. So this is sort of why I, again, among other things, it's not about adre the adrenals per se. But there's a variety of stress signals that come from outside the hypothalamus, along with feedback signals from cor of cortisol to the hypothalamus and the pituitary that determine what is that signal? What is that ACTH signal that is eventually going to drive cortisol production? So you've all seen this, this loop. It goes down from, from ACTH. Um, or, or excuse me, CRH to ACTH, and then cortisol has the feedback loops. We've all heard that. And we know that the feedback inhibition, depending on the sensitivity of that in the pituitary and, and the hypothalamus can change. So in the case of major depression, you have this signal that seems to be low, and that's why you have a, a higher ACTH and a higher cortisol. With adults with PTSD, there's a hypersensitivity to that feedback inhibition, and that down, it turns the ACTH low, and typically those people have a high DHA high DHEA and low cortisol. So this is sort of the, the standard sort of loop that you've all learned. And why is this so important? Well, cortisol is a major signal of cellular transcription in almost every tissue in the body. So it is a major, if, you're, if you don't understand, we're not going to go through glucocorticoid receptors, but essentially these are transcription factors. When, when cortisol or glucocorticoids bind, they, they do something in, in almost every cell. And we're going to see why that's so important uh, later on. But cortisol signaling, again, this is one of those things where I'm just seeding here. You're not, trying to, you're, you're not going to remember all these things. Uh, but cortisol production is not the final determinant of what happens to the cell. Cortisol floats around mostly in the bound form. So you have, 
you, have, you can metabolize your cortisol at different rates. Most of your cortisol, up to 90, 95% or more of it, is bound to corticosteroid binding globulin. So it's not necessarily active. So the, the production and the, the facilitating of binding plays a part. You probably know about 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 1 and 2. They convert cortisol to its inactive cortisone and back and forth. And that can be upregulated and downregulated. And then, of course, there's all kinds of signaling that goes on with the glucocorticoid receptor. There's heat shock proteins that actually change the glucocorticoid receptor sens sensitivity uh, and shape and life lifespan, and et cetera. And then you have DHEA, which can act as a counter-regulatory hormone. And then you have a number of potentially other signals which might actually modulate mitochondrial uh, effects in the cells independent of the glucocorticoid receptor altogether. Um, so just because you measure someone's cortisol doesn't necessarily you know how that cortisol is affecting each tissue because a lot of these are being affected in different tissues at different cells at different time of the day. So you, you have to understand that this is a very, very dynamic process, not just determined only by the amount of cortisol that's floating around. So what is the real goal of the stress response? Well, the real goal of the stress response is to maintain effective blood supply. So you need oxygen and nutrients to the brain, to the heart, to the skeletal muscle to survive. Okay, so that is, that's what we want to think of as the stress response. So you can see right away, it is a nutrient transporting or a nutrient modulating, or we might say an energy modulating system. Okay, it increases energy production when we need it. So there's upregulation, uh, there's, there's uh, a freeing up of glucose and fatty acids and amino acids. You're trying to optimize. And if you look at what uh, mitochondria do when, when under the, uh, the appropriate amount of, of good stress, let's call it, uh, it optimizes ATP production. But a lot of times it does this at the expense of long-term uh, metabolic function. So sort of like we think of this a triage theory. We need to survive now. We need to survive through tomorrow, let's say. But we don't care about when we're 50 or 60 or 80 or whatever. That's not, we're not, we're not worried about that. So I, I also give, I give this picture. The same roads that we use to drive down are the same roads that the emergency vehicles. And so when there's an emergency, Everyone is supposed to get off to the side of the road and let the emergency vehicles go through. That's essentially what your met metabolism is sort of doing. Every time there's a stress response, that takes priority, but it, it uses the same metabolic uh, pathways that the normal metabolism uses. So they get out of the way and you, become, you start dumping glucose out because you need to survive the next six hours. But dumping glucose out on a regular basis is really not good for the body. Okay, but it's really good for the body, maybe for the next six hours. But if you're doing that, obviously, every six hours, this is a bad plan. So I'm, I'd like you to start thinking differently about the stress response as an energy management system. It upregulates metabolic systems to coincide with diurnal activities and energy needs. So we're going to see here, just like Felice is saying, there's a lot of circadian components. Actually, cortisol is one of the main regulators of that. It modulates cell, meta cell metabolism in anticipation of energy availability. When is cortisol the highest? Morning. morning. When do you think your energy need is the highest? The morning. Okay, so it's anticipating you're going to be taking in food, and it's now going to get ready for that. So it prepares, prepares immune functions for increased vulnerabilities. Immune functions are typically low at night. They come back up during the day. In an emergency, all of this has to be overridden in order to survive a crisis. So the hypothalamus, and we're certainly not going to go through all this, but none of these nuclei are named. This is the stress nuclei. This, this measures stress. All of these nuclei are there to measure different components, uh, blood pressure, water levels, glu uh, glycemic levels, um, and it pulls all this in temperature, et cetera. All these kinds of things are pulled together. And then from the higher order of the brain, it adds to all the things you're seeing because there's nothing in here that recognizes uh, what your ex-girlfriend looks like. But when you see it and you're like, okay, this is a stressful moment, now my, my, hypothal my hypothalamus is going to know that I, I'm under stress, okay? So all of these nuclei, the two that we typically think about are the paraventricular nucleus. This is sort of the consolidator of all that information, which is going to send that signal to the pituitary. And then the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is going to be the timing, the circadian rhythm part of this. So those two play the greatest, let's say, uh, signaling capacity within all of these other nuclei. And of course, 
we know that that signal that we typically talk, talk about goes over and binds, uh, produces CRH or CRF, the, the two are interchangeable, CRH, and it binds to the CRH1 receptor. And it, this is what triggers the preform, you know, we have preform ACTH, and it triggers that release. Now, Dr. Gilliam's complete session continues to address the topics of CRH receptors, HPA and clocks, circadian and biological rhythm, and yes, as you know, this session is available in our Spring Congress All Access Pass package, which you can purchase using the link on your screen. Now, our next session is a little bit longer, and we'll take a short break at the end. We will hear from Dr. Joel Heidelbog, MD, FAAFP, FACG a clinical professor at the University of Michigan Medical School. He's also a primary care representative for the American Gastroenterological Association guidelines. Our clip from Dr. Heidelberg's evidence-based approach to irritable bowel syndrome session will clearly define IBS and provide steps for accurately and confidently diagnosing IBS in your clinical practice. So let's start with epidemiology, burden of illness, and misconception about irritable bowel syndrome. How many of you treat patients with irritable bowel syndrome? And how many of you feel very confident in the treatment that you're providing them? It's hard. It's very hard. How many of you have cured irritable bowel syndrome? Now the lights are bright, I don't see any hands, but has anybody cured irritable bowel syndrome? Okay, I didn't think so. Me neither. It's very hard. And we start with telling people that we can't cure it. It is a real disease, but we're going to make your life better. Okay. It's a real disorder. It's common in Western Europe and North America. It's less common in Asia. It's estimated at about 11% worldwide and 12% in the US. Most patients present between ages 30 and 50 years. And there's often decreased reporting in older patients. Well, the older we get, I think uh, as, as uh, things change, it's, it's not reported as often uh, relative to changes in stools. IBS is more reported and therefore it's thought to be more prevalent in women than in men. It's commonly overlooked in men. And it estimates approximately an average of 14 hours loss of work productivity in a 40 hour week. That's huge, that's huge. Um, there's a graded decrease in prevalence with increasing income. And it's second only to gastroesophageal reflux disease in terms of burden of illness. So let's talk about myths and misconceptions. Um, I get a lot of patients referred to my practice from my colleagues and, and folks outside of the U of M system. And they'll come and they'll say, uh, I saw a doc. They told me I have this irritable bowel to something or other. And they told me I'm crazy. They said, it's all in my head. They told me there's no cure, and they told me to stop eating fish or whatever. So uh, the biggest misconception we have is that it's purely a psychological-based diagnosis. I'm going to have a slide in a few minutes that highlight a number of different um, potential etiologies in a timeline. There are a lot of unknown mechanisms, and there's a lot of factors at play here. And Understanding it's difficult to diagnose, there are diagnostic criteria and we no longer call it a diagnosis of exclusion. The reality is it is real, it is multifactorial, and most patients actually don't have a psychological comorbidity. Now, it gets into a little bit of chicken and egg phenomenon in the sense that some patients may have anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, what have you, other things, and may develop some symptoms. A lot of patients are gonna have symptoms and have profound symptoms, and then from that, develop anxiety and depression and other issues. We know that serotonin plays a large role, and we know that diagnosis can be made accurately in primary care practices and other practices. This slide highlights a lot of patient perceptions of irritable bowel syndrome, starting with common knowledge. So patients will know that it's a combination of abdominal pain and constipation, and that can be with or without diarrhea and with or without bloating. Um, they also know that there may be triggers, such as stress, and that may be work or relationships or other factors. Common misconceptions that patients have is that irritable bowel syndrome will develop into colitis 
or cancer or needing surgery or leading to malnutrition and that it ultimately may worsen with age. Patients wanna know how to treat it. Patients wanna know what it is. Patients want validation that it's a real disease. And they wanna know what foods to avoid. Um, also, they wanna know how to cope and how to improve upon symptoms. So when we look at health-related quality of life, it has a negative impact. Um, I'm thinking of a number of patients of mine, I can think of it easily a dozen off the top of my head, where I am frequently completing uh, FMLA forms. Everybody know what that is? Of course. Um, work, uh, work excuses, et cetera, because they can't work because of irritable bowel syndromes uh, and symptoms. Failure to recognize this impact can impact the relationship that we have with patients. There's a lot of work that's been done and you can, uh, you can actually access a lot of this through the Rome Foundation that guides us in how to talk to patients and validate that this is a real disease with real symptoms. So it's imperative that we identify the predominant symptoms. It's imperative that we gauge severity and that we understand the negative impact. Let's talk about pathophysiology. Um, this is a, a slide that's been um, put together and, and all the elements have been combined over decades to be able to come to this summary slide. So we know there are genetic factors and we know there's environmental factors and oftentimes they're very hard to identify. We know that about one out of six or one out of seven patients with irritable bowel syndrome will report that at some point they had acute gastroenteritis. That's tough because most adults at some point in their life have had some form of gastroenteritis or the flu, the, the stomach flu. Um, other precipitating factors is listed here relative to um, anything that can be from lifestyle to emotional stress. Some people have an abuse history, but not all, certainly. Pathophysiology plays a lot of role here in understanding enteric neuropathy, motor disturbances, this term visceral hypersensitivity, big word, very real, serotonin implicated, abnormal central processing of sensations, psychologic disturbances, and then you get over to food and stress, and that's really more of your day-to-day -day factors. A lot of that is, is what causes a lot of the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome to wax and wane. This creates the symptoms, and then this often leads to consultation. So this slide, I, for me, I come back to this a lot, and I've shown patients this a lot over the years in, to help them understand how we get to an understanding of IBS today. What's the impact of quality of life? So I'm not gonna read through all of this, it's a busy slide. But in terms of severity, about, about half of patients with IBS rated as at least moderate severity, with about one out of five being severe. It interferes with life, it interferes with relationships, and if you look on the quality of life score, the average score is about 50, which, which falls in a moderate category. Other associated conditions and factors as well. And so we will see patients with irritable bowel syndrome that also have a host of other comorbid disorders. And certainly it, it can be very difficult to tease out or define when patients have other GI disorders. And these include reflux, uh, dyspepsia, cyclic vomiting, gastroparesis. Many of these may end up being organic. Many of these may end up being functional. And I think that's an important distinction to make. I'm gonna correct myself as soon as I say the word functional and I, I'll, uh, I'll ask for forgiveness here because it appears several times in the slides. The term functional bowel disorders or functional diseases is going away a little bit in the realm of GI to be replaced with disorders of gut-brain interaction. We talked before about psychiatric disorders and Yes, there are a number of patients that may have some psychiatric disorders and then ultimately develop IBS, but certainly not all and certainly not most. Chronic back pain, fibromyalgia, musculoskeletal conditions, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, a lot of overlap with those entities, chronic headaches and migraines, chronic pelvic pain, um, functional urinary symptoms, things like interstitial cystitis, also chronic um, painful bladder syndrome, these are things that uh, are certainly real entities, but often do not have an organic etiology. Dysmenorrhea, sexual dysfunction, these are also very common overlapping entities that impact our patients' lives. This slide shows a nice Venn diagram of uh, a lot of what I've said with IBS at the central core and CC or chronic 
constipation or chronic idiopathic constipation. I'm gonna talk about again in a few minutes. I think it starts with history. I think it starts with um, longitudinal care. How many of you get an hour per patient? 30 minutes, 20, 15. I hate asking less than 15. Anybody get less than 15? All right, so especially in primary care, you know, when I'll uh, um, be discussing bowel issues or if I think we're going down the IBS road with a patient, I have to dedicate an entire visit to that. So I work in primary care. I still pr uh, practice full scope family medicine. And it's not uncommon that somebody's gonna come in for follow-up on back pain, diabetes, hypertension, and then they're gonna say, oh yeah, by the way, I think I got IBS. I need a whole visit for that. And it deserves a whole visit for that. I can't do that in a 20 minute visit with everything else. So let's talk about how we make these diagnoses. Careful history. Uh, looking for warning signs. And this is important because I think we're in the business of not missing anything. I think we're in the business of making sure we provide complete care. And I think we're also very good at ordering tests. And I'm gonna talk about that as we go through. Performing a thorough physical examination. Um, there's a lot of work through the Rome Foundation that validating diagnosis of IBS, validating uh, trueness of symptoms, validating what you find on physical examination, or more importantly, what you may not find on physical examination is very important. I think it's gotten harder in the COVID era. I think it's gotten a lot harder in the COVID era. How many people do virtual care? Yeah, there's no physical exams. It's gotten a lot harder. Um, using the room for, for criteria, I'll have a slide on that, and then classifying into appropriate subtype and performing limiting diagnostic tests. So here are the room for criteria. How many of you use this in your daily practice? Loaded question on my part, we're doing a study across about 40 countries to find how primary care providers use Rome 4 diagnosis in clinical practice. So just by show of hands, how many people use Rome 4 in their clinical practice in terms of diagnosis? Okay. Recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort at least one day out of the week on average in the last three months. And that's associated with two or more of the following. That's related to defecation, onset associated with change in frequency of stool or form of stool. And then these criteria are fulfilled for at least the, three, uh, the last three months with symptom onset at least six months prior to diagnosis. This is important because this explains chronicity. This explains pain. This explains change in form and frequency of stool. I think we're all in the habit of ordering a lot of tests. Um, we don't want to miss things. We want to work things up appropriately. If you use Rome 4 criteria appropriately and there are no alarm symptoms of upper or lower GI disease, you can accurately make a diagnosis of IBS. In some patients, it may be worthwhile to consider a SED rate or a CBC or a CRP or calprotectin. Um, one question I always get asked about IBS, and IBS is not a bloody disease, okay? So if there's blood in the stool, that's a different workup, okay? And that's where you're gonna get into some of these things. Celiac serologies, certainly gluten sensor uh, enteropathy, I think we see a lot of it. I think we still miss some. Uh, in, in the appropriate patients that may have chronic diarrhea, that may be certainly appropriate. And then a GIPCR and Giardia are also part of the recommendation to rule out um, uh, enteric pathogens. But not all patients require testing. Not all patients require testing. And I, we see a lot that are over-tested. Um, I've seen patients sent to me that have had you know, four and five CAT scans, um, and you don't always need that. Guess what the CAT scans show? They didn't show anything. And there's no role for colonoscopy in all patients. This is separate from routine colon cancer screening. This is not electron colon cancer screening today, but certainly now with guidelines changing to start at the age of 45, some of your patients may be eligible for that. Subtypes are based on stool consistency. Uh, this is one of several slides I'll often pull up um, on the computer when I'm seeing patients. I think it's helpful to show to patients because then they can look and say, yep, that's me, okay? So it highlights prevalence of constipation predominant and diarrhea predominant. There's about 25% that fall in an unknown category, and then there's a percentage that fall in that mixed category where you can go back and forth.
This slide shows stool consistency, very easy for patients to identify with and for them to be able to identify uh, where they fall on the scale or, or, or where they alternate on the scale as well. Again, type one uh, you know, showing more slow gut transit and type seven showing rapid gut transit. It's important to separate out the distinction between irritable bowel syndrome that's constipation predominant and chronic idiopathic constipation. And the main difference is going to be pain. The main difference is going to be visceral pain, okay? When you take a bowel history on patients, it's not going to be abnormal to hear a patient say, I only have a bowel movement every two or three days. It's been that way my whole life. There's no pain associated with it. There's no other symptoms associated with it, okay? So the visceral hypersensitivity component is important as a distinctive marker for IBSC, and again, that gets back to Rome for criteria. Busy slide, but this is gonna be the keys to the kingdom here, okay? This is the evaluation of chronic constipation for our patients. Patient has infrequent and or hard stool and or difficult to pass stool when not on laxatives. Again, history and physical examination is important. We need to take a look at whether or not someone's on a drug or medication that makes them constipated, often overlooked, often overlooked, okay? And when possible, can we stop those medications? Um, investigations we talked about in terms of screening, we talked about colonoscopy. Um, if there's any abnormality identified, certainly that gets referred. You wanna rule out cancer, you wanna rule out obstructing lesions. It's also important to look at metabolic things, and I think that's also a fair uh, assessment to make sure that uh, uh, they aren't hypothyroid or hypocalcemic. Functional constipation, again, it's important to explain the pathophysiology and understand that. I'm gonna get into some brief points on modifying lifestyle and diet. And if there is symptom improvement, now you've got something to build on going forward. If there's not symptomatic improvement, um, there's other tests you can do. And, and this is a bit out of the scope of, uh, of today's lecture, but this gets into um, referrals for anorectal function, manometry, colonic transit, et cetera. So when you refer to a specialist, and by specialist I usually mean gastroenterologist here, there are a lot of clinicians out there that have a, a specialty and specialty interest in irritable bowel syndrome. Any warning signs or alarm features, any new onset of symptoms over the age of 50, I believe they may change that number going forward simply because, again, the guidelines for colorectal cancer screening are now at 45. Any bleeding gets investigated, IBS is not a bloody disorder. Any unexplained weight loss, a uh, patient that's got a family history of inflammatory bowel disease or colon cancer, that's gonna get uh, worked up differently. Anything on abnormal physical examination. And then, um, you know, severe or progressive symptoms. And again, I think this stresses the longitudinal component of the care that we provide. Many patients, if not most patients, are gonna come into our offices and say, all right, I think this is what I have. Got on the internet and read about it. Um, and I've already started trying this, 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 and this. And a lot of these things you can do, you can do over the counter. So it's important to understand what they're already trying and if there's any failure to improve with fiber, laxatives, or over the counter things, it's important to work this up. So let's talk about treatment and I'm gonna highlight constipation and diarrhea related um, disorders of brain gut interaction. Again, I need to change my slide because the terminology just changed. We look at a schematic for graded treatment. Most people are gonna fall in, in, um, in the category where mild treatment is going to benefit them. This is diet and lifestyle. This is explaining it's a positive diagnosis. This is offering reassurance. The reassurance is really based on the fact that, um, that while this may be a chronic disease that may have some waxing and waning, it's not um, often severe and it does not lead to cancer, colitis, malnutrition, et cetera, et cetera, the other things I highlighted before. Some patients are gonna fall in that moderate category and they may need more care, more frequent care. Um, this is the, the category where you often introduce pharmacotherapy, I'll talk about that. And I think it's always important to talk about realistic and shared goals. Again, I'm gonna highlight the Rome Foundation uh, that's done a fantastic amount of work on strategies of how clinicians can interact with patients and offer reassurance. Uh, for those that fall in the, the severe graded treatment, 
uh, category, it's really important to address psychosocial factors that can cause exacerbation of disease, how to manage stress, and really the goal is to improve functioning because this is really where it's gonna impact their life. It's gonna impact relationships, work, et cetera, et cetera. When I see this slide, I always think of a patient of mine who I have worked to advocate for tirelessly over the number of years. She works on the assembly line at an automotive plant for General Motors. She has um, diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome and fecal incontinence. And I write letters for her uh, employer and I fill out FMLA forms every six months religiously. Well, I copy and paste them from the previous one and sign the new date, but you see what I'm saying. Um, and they often give her a hard time about going to the bathroom at work because she has to leave the assembly line and it's gonna slow down production. So it can be a challenge. Our thanks to Dr. Heidelbog. His full session will be available in our Spring Congress All Access Pass and continues with a review of dietary strategies and recommendations, how to treat and minimize symptoms, and pharmacologic and complementary alternative medicine strategies. We'll now take a 10 minute break, but be sure to come back and join us as we'll next hear from main stage speaker, Dr. Deanna Minnick on mood disorders and nutritional influence. You'll also hear from our faculty panel, Drs. Erica Schwartz, Andrew Heyman, and Pamela Smith, as they share their key takeaways from the Spring Congress, followed by a Q&A session with Drs. Schwartz and Sahar Spadan. You don't want to miss these sessions. Berkeley Life Professionals team of nitric oxide experts are driven to create clinically efficacious, practitioner-exclusive nitric oxide support solutions. Nitric oxide has a critical role in regulating vasodilation and circulation in the body. But as you age, your body makes less nitric oxide naturally. Berkeley Life's nitric oxide support supplement provides enough dietary nitrates, the building blocks of nitric oxide, for full day support. Berkeley Life saliva test strips an A4M conference favorite, allow practitioners to assess nitric oxide levels with patients in office. Finally, layer on the topical nitric oxide serum for precise immediate delivery of nitric oxide to the skin. This month only, your purchase of Berkeley Life Supplement unlocks 25% off wholesale serum pricing, available exclusively to practitioners. Order by email at info at berkeleylife.com for access to the serum special, or order anytime online at berkeleylife.com. Well, I was in multiple sessions, uh, but in module five, where we talk about systems biology medicine, the two top takeaways are, first of all, if you're a practitioner, try to identify where the big metabolic roadblocks are for an individual so that if you're beginning to work with them, that you get some early wins, they start to feel better, that they notice symptoms starting to go down because that's gonna be motivating for that patient to continue on this path of them rejuvenating their health, right? So that's the first takeaway is make sure you're pointing towards how do I get results as quickly as possible. Secondly, it's approaching the person as a system of systems that you're always working with a person's completeness of their chemistry and that you want to look at the relationships between the various organs and systems and hormones so that you begin to get a global perspective about that person and where they need the most help to begin with. And I think if you start with that in mind, uh, module five can really be incredibly helpful because it helps you to target with precision where you need to begin.
promote the health of your patients and the health of your business. Deliver great care with game-changing analysis of patient outcomes and promote a real-time quantifiable display of your great outcomes on your website with your own outcome ticker. With OutcomeMD, say goodbye assumptions and hello data-driven care. Schedule a demo today to lock in special pricing at sales at outcomemd.com. All right. If you listen to the session, the top five takeaways are one, the horrifying part is toxins are everywhere. Two, you can take control of this narrative though. You have control. Three, eat amazing, high quality, organic, minimally processed food. Four, if you have mercury or silver amalgam fillings, get them out. And five, it's really important to do a full workup of people's lives and look at everything that might be contributing to exposure to toxins. And that's, that's the hard part, but do a full workup. In my opinion, the first step in solving a problem is to define the problem. And one thing I can say about my session and, and everything that I've seen at the A4M is really defining the problem, understanding what is going on in the body. Once you understand the basic fundamental issues that you need to address, then you can come up with clear, defined, pragmatic and efficacious modalities to actually help to improve quality of life, healthy longevity, and really, ultimately, happiness. This Encore presentation is sponsored by Biocytin Botanicals, a recognized leader in the field of botanical supplements and a pioneer in the arena of microbiome health. Its flagship broad spectrum botanical blend, Biocidin, was formulated in 1989 in response to challenging health conditions related to microbial imbalances. More than 30 years later, the company offers a curated line of targeted support products to boost patient health. Enjoy an extended show discount by entering code 22 Encores C15. That's 22 E N C O R E S C15 at checkout to receive 15% off site wide savings until May 31st, 2022. Some exclusions apply. Well, the physicians who are here 
all want to do better for their patients. And I think the world is changing, healthcare is changing. It's becoming about the patient at the center of healthcare. So I think that what they're gonna be taking home is how to help their patients better, better eat, better expand their lifespan, and also improve their health span having less chronic illnesses. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the break. We'll now hear from our main stage speakers, Dr. Deanna Minnick, PhD, a researcher, educator, and functional medicine trained clinician who has a unique approach to nutrition that combines physiology and psychology. Today, she will share with us the three root causes on why mood disorders exist. Let's hear from her now. All right, so first let's go through the root causes. You know, one of the things that we look at within integrative medicine is really looking at the why. So if we can understand the why, we can understand the what and the how. So let's first talk about inflammation because I do think that everybody is inflamed until proven otherwise. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, inflammation is the bedrock for so many different chronic diseases. And when we think of mood disorders, things like anxiety and depression, gut imbalance, much of these are connected to having some kind of inflammation in the body, whether acutely or more chronically, which would be called inflammaging. There's a new term now in the literature called coagulaging. So we see that inflammation is connected to increased coagulation. So we bring in a bit of the heart and the cardiovascular system as well. And you know, the brain is much like any other organ. It can get sick. It can be seen as a tissue that corresponds and can be looked at, at on the organ level. So this brain on fire, as Dr. Bland and others have coined over the years in functional medicine, really looking at how the brain responds to these inflammatory cytokines. And we're learning so much more about all the different kinds of cytokines produced by the different tissues, especially the adipose tissue. Any tissue that contains a lot of fat, a lot of lipid, will be more prone to these inflammatory cytokines by the nature of the fatty acid composition. So when I think of mood disorders and I think of this triad of cortisol and stress, causing a lot of this inflammation, and then looking at glucose and insulin. And we know that insulin activity in the brain is pivotal. It's pivotal for helping with reducing amyloid aggregation and helping with the metabolism of proteins and removing metabolites from the brain. So if we have inflammation, it disturbs the overall movement and metabolism of metabolites from the brain. Metabolic endotoxemia is a very common term now. So when we eat and we have dysbiosis, as Dr. Mullen talked about, what we can get is the increase of lipopolysaccharide. So we start to see that there's a system-wide inflammation that can occur. So just even having one meal has the potential to change mood. And I don't know if people really know of the impact of that. In fact, many people will say to me, oh, I don't believe that nutrition has anything to do with it. And I say, well, nutrition is not a belief system, it's science. And we know that even one meal, one short-term meal, can cause this imbalance. So how do we break the cycle? I think we do need to look at that. Now, 
Uh, what I very much like is how Dr. Mullen brought in this whole web of the psychology, the mind-body, together with the nutrition and the physiology. And that's really where we need to go. We've got to bridge that gap. Psychoneuroimmunology. And what we see with people who are inflamed is that they have a certain persona or a certain way that they demonstrate behavior in their environment. They tend to be more reactive. They tend to be more impulsive. They tend to have greater propensity towards anger and these other types of mood imbalances like anxiety and depression. So I do think that the way to break the cycle with a lot of these mood disorders is to get into the physiology, start to look at these inflammatory cytokines, and how do we quell the fire within? And we can do that through food. We can do that through a number of different things in, in the diet. And many people won't change what they are eating, but they may be able to change how they prepare those foods. So perhaps less grilling and broiling and frying which in and of itself produces a lot of advanced glycation end products causing inflammation. So stress. Stress is something that we're all prone to, and I think we have to reframe the terminology of stress. How do we get into resilience? And the times that people most need to eat a healthy diet would be when they're stressed, when they have these mood disorders. But what tends to happen is that that state fosters eating more of the inflammatory foods that just keep that cycle going. So again, if we can create a break in that loop where somebody gets relief from feeling depressed and anxious and reactive and angry, we might be able to create change in the next meal. So the second reason why mood disorders exist is because of the gut microbiome. Yes, we all know that we have more microorganisms that run us than cells of our own bodies. And when we think of leaky gut and this permeability, I want us to think symbolically here. So leaky gut, leaky brain. We start to see porosity. We start to see opening. We start to see the infiltration of that lipopolysaccharide that I was talking about from a meal where we can get metabolic endotoxic endotoxemia. So what tends to happen here is we, we lose the sense of diversity in the gut, and we need overall diversity to fortify and strengthen the gut. So one of the ways that we can help the gut microbiome, and Dr. Mullen went through many different ways, and of course we need to personalize, we have to tailor to the person, but I am going to talk about fiber, because I, I think we need to see fiber in a much different way than we have in the past. We need to rotate fibers. We need to create that diversity through the rotation of many different fibers coming in. And what we're learning is that many of these prebiotic fibers, how they are fermented and metabolized are actually giving us much more active secondary metabolites. And some of them help to promote brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, which helps with neuronal cell growth and plasticity so through the gut, through the gut microbiome, we can help with better communication through our neurons. This is a, uh, the many paths to having mood uh, changes within the gut. And starting from left to right, you can see the pathways of stress. Dr. Mullen talked about that, that again, that mind-body connection, which is huge. It's part of the five-hour program to gut healing, relax and rebalance. Then the second one is serotonin regulation. I think what we're going to see on the horizon within the science is much more in the way of understanding why our gut is producing so much in the way of these neurotransmitters and hormones. Melatonin and GABA and serotonin, uh, acetylcholine, and a lot of foods actually contain those compounds as well. So how does that trigger the cascade in the gut? Inflammation, obviously we've already talked about, and inflammatory cytokines do do some cross-talking over with the serotonin metabolism pathway, and we can start to see excitotoxicity. We can start to see changes in neuronal cells that are even in the gut as a result of that interconnection. And then, of course, let's not forget insulin, which is so tightly tied to uh, cortisol. 
So how do we add life back to the gut? I'm going to talk a bit about the spectrum of biotics, a lot of different ones that are out now. And again, just to come back to fiber, I'm a huge fan of fiber, even more than probiotics, I must say. Let's get the gut on right. Let's get the environment nice and um, comfy for all of those microorganisms that we want to take residence there, because it's not so much just bringing in more probiotics. It's about creating a milieu that will encourage the growth and the adhesion of those microorganisms. So we can do that with fiber. I really like this study uh, in particular. It was a review article looking at the benefit of whole fruits. There's a lot of controversy about fruit these days. To fruit or not to fruit? And I don't think it's a yes or a no. I think it's a, a person dependent decision. I also think uh, it's about the different kinds of foods that we take in within that fruit category. So as you can see here, with greater levels of fiber intake, there were lower odds ratios for having depression or at least depressive symptoms. And in this particular uh, way that they put the data together, that was even greater for fruit and vegetable fiber compared to cereal fiber, but they both had an effect. So short chain fatty acids, I really want you to be thinking about that butyrate. In fact, uh, some people find that butyrate is even so potent that they'll just supplement with butyrate as a standalone. A lot of these short chain fatty acids bring into balance not just the structural integrity through helping with tight junctions, but creating a better mucin layer. So not a mucus layer, but a mucin protective layer, which we can see with these short chain fatty acids, as well as certain plant compounds like eugenol from thyme, which can help to build back that healthy mucin layer. We can also see the, um, that the colonocytes can use the short chain fatty acids for energy. And we're doing lots of, again, signaling throughout the body, changing things like cortisol and even encouraging the production of BDNF. So you can see here this interlocking web of how we, we start with the diet at the bottom, bringing in these prebiotic fibers. And if we have a gut milieu that can help to chew up those prebiotic fibers and give us a lot of these short chain fats, we can then get the power to signal more broadly and widely throughout the body, even to the extent of the blood-brain barrier. Now, there's a, a new term out there on the horizon. A lot of these different biotics are cropping up. Uh, psychobiotics is a term that is now being talked about. So what are psychobiotics? These are probiotics that may have targeted action towards neuropsychiatric conditions specifically. Can you imagine if we did have these targeted strains that we knew would go in and start to manufacture things like GABA, things like serotonin, where it was very specific. So I do think that we're starting to see some of that on the horizon. Now, the third point that I probably feel most passionate about, just because of my professional lineage, is that of nutrient imbalance. I, I do think that we have to start with food because that's somewhat within our locus of control. And many people eat what I call the brown, yellow, and white, high aging, high inflammation type of diet, right? You know, just think what most people have for breakfast. They have a lot of um, refined grains. They have uh, toast. They have uh, meats that are perhaps overly grilled. So they're starting the day on an inflammatory foot or in, in this type of milieu. And as a result of not having that nutrient density, we're missing a lot in the way of the cofactors, the vitamins, the minerals that we need for proper formation of things like neurotransmitters and even hormones. How do we start to replete things like cortisol? How do we get that vitamin C back in? Now, you're going to see that one of the things that I talk with everybody about is color and bringing in the rainbow. And the reason I talk in a very simplified way about it is because there's a lot of science underneath that statement. And in fact, the phytonutrients that are contained within these plant-based foods are priming and modulating cellular activities that do connect directly to mood response. Things like 
insulin sensitivity and stress response and even inflammatory cytokine production within the cell. And plants are pleiotropic, meaning that they work in multiple ways and they help to modulate or just turn down that dial or that signal when it's been too amplified. So here are some tips. I mentioned I'm going to get very practical with you because I do think we have to hit the ground running with this information. You know, we are coming off of a two-year pandemic, and uh, some would say it's still continuing, and some would say we're long out of it. But in either case, there's a lot of mood imbalance going on right now. Suicide risk is at an all-time high. We're seeing increased rates of uh, mood disorders like anxiety and depression. And it's been predicted that for the next three to five years, this is going to be on everybody's radar. So licensed mental health therapists are um, becoming uh, super saturated with clinical visits. Um, we, there's just so much here that we can be doing with food. So I'm going to detail to you the food and mood tracker that I developed, and you're free to use that as you'd like. One other thing that I think is really important is to see side by side what we eat and how we live. Because I do think that how we eat is how we live, how we live is how we eat. And if we can use something like a diet, nutrition, and lifestyle journal, one page where we can see what are people eating, what are they doing? I think that that already forms a really great discussion point. Another thing I really like to do, especially if there's a history of eating disorders, which many times tie into mood disorders, is to do a very quick eating timeline where you have just a line that represents their, the chronology of their lives. And I ask for the top 10 most significant eating events in their lives. And they can determine what is significant and what is an eating event. So they tell their story through these top 10 events. So let me tell you a little bit about the food and mood tracker. Again, you're, you're able to use this as you'd like. I also have a, uh, an eat the rainbow type tracker where people can simply very, uh, in, in one page, just check the colors that they're eating per day. And if we eat colorful foods, chances are we're going to have colorful moods. So that's what I talk with them about, is if you're eating brown, yellow, and white all the time, and it's devoid, it's ultra-processed, that's like a symbol for your life. You're probably burnt out yourself. You're probably saying you have a leaky life that parallels your leaky gut. So how do you make people aware of this connection? This is why I wanted to create something like this food and mood tool. So it's very simple. I like to have things very short, concise. It's one page. And for seven days, they track the colors of their foods alongside of the colors of their moods. And I define the colors of their moods. So for example, red is angry, frustrated. Orange is playful, adventurous. Yellow is joyful and happy. Green is loving and grateful. And uh, blue purple is sad, depressed. Brown is worried, anxious. And white is open-minded and hopeful. Now, you don't have to use that in that structure. You could also, I, I have an emotion log where I have about 25 different emotions and people just check off at the end of the day how they felt. You know, it's really interesting to me how many people don't know what an emotion is. So I've, I've workshopped this type of food and mood type of um, interface before with people and I'll go around and the first thing I'll ask everybody is, how do you feel? And I remember in one workshop, the first person started and she said, I'm concentrating. And then the second person said, I'm focused. And I'm thinking, these are not emotional words. These people are up in their heads. They're in this mental sphere of intellectualism and they're not fully in their gut and in their bodies. So we needed to do it all over again. And we talked about what is an emotion? We are so far removed from emotions and how we feel, we've subjugated them. We've really replaced them with the intellect. We try to move ourselves intellectually out of that emotional sphere. But it's some of the greatest information that we could be getting about our bodies. So I do think that people see emotions as weakness, and I think that this encourages a connection with emotions, the spectrum of those emotions, and then to see 
how there's a pattern with food intake. Thank you, Dr. Minnick. We met up with Drs. Erica Schwartz, Andrew Heyman, and Pamela Smith earlier this week to hear their key learnings and insights from the Spring Congress. Let's share that with you now. I am thrilled to be joined by our esteemed panelists, so let's immediately dive in. I'm going to direct specific questions to each of you, but if others have thoughts that you'd like to share, please feel free to do so. So Dr. Smith, let's start off with you. Now you attended the cannabis workshop. What are some of the key takeaways you had from that session? Well, you know, it's really interesting. I went to the workshop, honestly, just for knowledge, and it is a workshop that every single practitioner should take. I may or may not decide to use cannabis or THC in my practice, but I learned so much in this workshop. I had no idea the basic science behind it all and that you could use THC and, and really marijuana for the idea of obesity and for anxiety, depression, even cancer. It was just fascinating to me to really go through the science, go through the different disease processes, and really look at the cannabinoid receptors. I highly recommend it. Everybody should take this, even if you're not going to prescribe any of these things in your practice, because you should just have the basic knowledge and the patients are asking questions. Fantastic, thank you for that. That's a great takeaway. Um, Dr. Heyman, let's go to you. Can you share what you learned about the GI tract and its interconnectedness? Well, I found it extraordinary and I, I learned a lot as well because it, it, it appears that, you know, as we call the gut, the second brain, it really does influence just about every bodily system you could think of from the immune system, generating systemic inflammation and being linked to autoimmune conditions to the direct relationship to the central nervous system and all the new research on the relationship between gut health and neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's and the bi-directional relationship with stress. I mean, who knew that stress had such a big effect on the gut in terms of composition of the microbiome and even the leakiness and the reactivity of the uh, immune system. And then finally, just metabolism and hormone balance that, that obesity is linked to gut health and how we break down hormones is linked to gut health. It just, there isn't any body system that I can think of that doesn't have some sort of relationship to the gut. And, and I think that that sort of recommendation of, if you're not sure where to start with a really complicated patient, it's probably a good idea to start with the gut. Well, there's of course so much great conference content. So Dr. Schwartz, what did you surmise is missing from today's traditional medical training? Um, well, clearly the connection between nutrition and health and nutrition and disease prevention and nutrition and pretty much every part of our body and how, um, you know, it's better, it's getting better. They now have a semester of nutrition, uh, but they're still, they don't look at nutrition as important as a piece of maintaining health, prevention, improving health span, improving like the uh, longevity part of it even though since 1935, we've known about how important certain areas of nutrition are in healthcare. So I think that what was so great about this conference, and I recommend anybody who has like any interest in helping their patients in a 360 degree way, listen to the lectures and pay attention because nutrition is a crucial part of it and it helps with guiding people because you are what you eat and we've been hearing this since I guess the uh, medieval times and yet um, in the conventional medical field and healthcare it's missing and as an example was a uh, a patient of mine that went to see a gastroenterologist who I'm friends with, who's wonderful, and just had a upper and lower endoscopy. And um, at no point that this doctor, who's wonderful at what he does, um, ask him, ask my patient about what is he eating? 
And maybe the symptoms that he's complaining of are connected to what he eats. So I think that that's why I think that the conference was so important because bringing in nutrition and looking at the whole of the human person is really a very, very important thing. Yeah, definitely asking patients the right mm -hmm. questions. Thank you for that. Um, so let's follow up with Dr. Heyman on why you believe practitioners can be better teachers on what topics? Well, actually, I think building right on uh, you know, Dr. Schwartz's comments, you know, at core for what we do, we're really trying to encourage people to live healthier and better lives and ultimately change their lifestyle. And we have to give them guidance around nutrition, exercise, sleep and stress management, to seek meaning and purpose in their lives and to adopt healthy habits and improve social connections, building resiliency at all levels. We also wanna point out you know, maladaptive behaviors and addictions and poor coping skills. And in the context of all that, we see these very special anti-aging techniques and they're very powerful, they're, they're very advanced, um, but they happen in this broader context. And they're only as effective as our ability to sort of properly motivate our patients and to help them to, to, to sustain healthy behaviors over time to ensure good outcomes. It's this separate skill set that I think we all could do a better job at in terms of motivational interviewing and helping people sustain healthy behaviors over time. You know, this is a real strategy. And, you know, it's one that I think sort of gets lost in the mix that we think, oh, we have the answer do this diet or take this hormone or take this supplement. But if we don't sort of treat people as whole people in whole environments, I think we're losing a big part of what we do. And it has to be, I think, a core identity of sort of that competent anti-aging provider. So I think it's something we all need to sort of think about and do better at and build our skills in that regard. I think that's the area where I see, you know, some opportunities for, for growth for honestly all of us. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And Dr. Smith, back to you. So why did you consider the immune workshop timely? Oh, obviously everything in medicine for the next five or 10 years is going to center around the immune system. Uh, COVID is here to stay. It's not leaving, it's a virus. Viruses don't go away. It will continue to mutate. And we also need to instruct our patients on not hyper immune their system meaning some people are taking so many things to build their immune system, they may actually end up with an autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself. So I think it's important from that viewpoint. Also, depending on the study that you read, between 30 and 40%, maybe even 50% of people will have COVID long haul syndrome, maybe for six months, two years, maybe lifelong. And we do have some answers for patients with COVID long haul. And so therefore the immune system workshop was absolutely wonderful. Starting from A to Z on what to do with patients that are asymptomatic all the way through people who end up in the ICU with intubation to people with COVID long haul, either from the disease or from the vaccine itself. Right, so um, Dr. Schwartz, I'm sure Many will appreciate this question, including myself. So why do you believe we can reverse the negative effects of aging with diet? I think that everything we do shows us how you can reverse. So let's just talk about drinking soda. Let's talk about drinking alcohol. Let's talk about eating dairy as we get older. And there is scientific data um, since, as I said, 1935, uh, showing how longevity is increased, you know, in mice at the, and, and that study that um, with calorie restriction and changing the diet, but you can do an experiment on yourself anytime by having a, a glass of soda and then seeing how you feel an hour, an hour and a half later, and then maybe two hours, three hours later, have a glass of water and see how you feel an hour and a half, two hours later. The same thing with alcohol, seeing how you feel and becoming aware of how our body responds to various things that we put in our mouth. It's like when you have dessert, when you go to a birthday party and you have cake, right? How do you feel an hour and a half later? Usually you're exhausted. 
everybody falls asleep, right? How do we feel at Thanksgiving after we eat this huge meal in the middle of the day? So there are, there are significant studies, there are an enormous amount of literature on what nutrition does and how eating the right things for your body at the right time will affect how you feel and how you get sick as you get older. That, you know, when, you know, Dr. Smith was talking about in, inflammation and about immune system and inflammation being caused by the foods we're eating, that the acidic foods, I mean, there's like the whole thing about GERD and about reflux, right? And that if you eat acidic foods, not only will you get arthritis, you'll get reflux, you'll get a lot of problems. And so all you have to do is just take out the acidic foods. And by that, I mean tomatoes, um, spiced foods, things that will increase acidity. So it's very easy to try on yourself. And then you can research the literature and find thousands upon thousands of articles that connect what you're eating to how you're feeling. Yeah, to your earlier point, it's um, what you eat or you are what you eat, right? So, right. yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Heyman, tell mm -hmm. us what you heard about resynchronized cortisol and why this is so important. I think it's a fascinating uh, subject. And it, and actually, I think, it, again, it gets to a bit of what Dr. Schwartz talked about, which is you know, eating the right thing at the right time. And, and that sort of reflects this notion that our physiology is meant to ebb and flow, and there's an internal coordination that reflects sort of a healthy state and also sort of a connection to the outside world that we're functioning in rhythm to the natural changes in nature around us. And our stress response um, is part of that symphony, to borrow a term from, from, from Dr. Smith, that in fact, all of our hormones are meant to flux in sort of predictable ways, including cortisol. And what's fascinating, if you look at the field of chronobiology, that when systems start to not flux, when they go flat, when they're not reacting to external pressures or threats, and we see this sort of diminishment of response, that's when human illness begins to arise. And it's really no different with cortisol. When you look at the literature on, on in the physiological psychology arena on cortisol, it should be high in the morning and low at the end of the day. And there's this sort of natural, what we call diurnal pattern. And what researchers tend to do is when they're looking for an impairment in the stress response, they actually measure the slope. They do what's called a regression analysis. And what they've shown is that the flatter the slope, the greater the impairment in the stress response and the worse outcomes that individual has, which I think is amazing. And what you find is that no matter what area of clinical medicine you look at, there are studies that show the flatter the slope, the worse the outcome. That's true for treatment resistant depression. It's true for autoimmune diseases. It's true for breast cancer in women. It's true for heart disease, that if you have a concurrent illness and you flatten your cortisol curve, you tend to do worse. Women have greater metastases and early mortality in breast cancer. Um, people have greater risk for um, MI and dying from that MI. Diabetics have worse outcomes and use more medications, all with a flattened cortisol curve. And that what we're trying to do with our intervention is to sort of resync up the body's ability to know when to have a high cortisol and when to have a low cortisol, and to ensure that we have these natural fluxes occurring. And, and Dr. Smith knew it from the beginning. She said, you know, Hormones are a symphony and, she, and that was right. It's like music with melody and harmony and you have to have those natural variations. And when they stop, that's when human illness arises. And that sort of aha moment, I think was really profound for me for this weekend. Dr. Smith, from your COVID long hauler protocol session, please share the symptoms you outlined in post COVID syndrome. Oh, there are numerous. People can have chest pain to heart racing and palpitations, shortness of breath, headaches, nausea, vomiting, depression, anxiety, fatigue, uh, even GI symptoms to go back to what Dr. Heyman was discussing. You can get gut symptoms and then dysregulation of cortisol. 
Uh, you can have orthostatic hypotension. There's many other symptoms you can have. The early research is now showing that COVID long haul syndrome for some patients, and perhaps for many patients, is reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. And some people are more prone to that reactivation. 95% of people in the world have had Epstein-Barr or mononucleosis. And for some reason, when people get COVID long haul, there may very well be a reactivation of Epstein-Barr, just the same as there is in rheumatoid arthritis, MS, and Sjogren syndrome. So a lot more to come. Please join us always at A4M because we are really the leaders in this area and we're the first to actually bring you the medical literature. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all for your keen insights and sharing your big aha moments from the Spring Con Congress. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was certainly a fascinating conversation that I enjoyed very, very much. And uh, now I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Swedan to join me on camera for a little bit more of a dialogue before we close out today's Congress. So uh, thank you both for being here. I know um, there was a lot of content that was shared here today. So um, Dr. Schwartz, I would like to start with you. In your session, you actually address steps that you can take to improving your health span. So can you give us a brief overview of those steps just to close us out? Well, I think because we were talking about nutrition, I think the key was about um, the effects of intermittent fasting, calorie restriction diets, and how they positively affect health span and lifespan. And I think the point was that we, while we have a significant increase in lifespan, we don't have a good enough increase in health span. And the goal is to increase health span, meaning to keep people healthy longer so that they can enjoy life and that we're not focused on spending all healthcare money on disease, but rather on enjoying life. So nutrition is really the key because with the proper nutrition, or as you've already seen today, um, the eating colorful, high fiber, eating the right way, foods that are healthy for your gut and your brain and every part of your body, you will actually improve the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And we really cover the, the gamut, if you will, um, um, you know, nutrition to mood disorders to IBS. I mean, there were many, many topics covered. So Dr. Swedan, for you, what session really stood out to you and why? Um, you know, honestly, all of them, because now we really have um, ITs. I actually just gave a lecture. I call it inflammatology, the only medical specialty left, right? And we really see this common thread and theme between all the lectures. Um, so IBS, I guess, stood to me, I've always been in pain management, neurology, migraine disease, and this is a very common comorbidity. And this is what always happened, really, right? We MRI, we CAT scan, we do all these tests, and they come back, quote unquote, normal, right? Because it's truly a functional dysfunction. Um, and now more and more of the data um, you know, and especially Dr. Gilliams, who I've had the pleasure of lecturing with on numerous occasions, you know, I always teach also when in doubt, start with the gut, right? Really, when you don't know what to do, always start with the gut because literally 80% of the immune system lines the GI tract. So it is really our first line of defense, but it's also our first line of potentially instigating this inflammatory cascade that can lead to all kinds of disorder from, you know, um, neuropsychiatric illness to migraines to neurodegenerative disorders to, you know, functional gut disorders and inflammatory bowel disease to, you know, pain in inflamed joints, inflamed anything. So, you know, we have a lot of ologists now as I tease and call, right? We have a lot of specialists and subspecialists, but really the common thread um, is, is healthy gut, healthy brain, you know, uh, gut brain connection, because really those two systems really kind of control a lot of the inflammatory cascade, keeping it in harmony. And sometimes we get really very, um, I guess, technical and we think, you know, way above 
um, you know, 30,000 foot levels, if you will, but sometimes it is really going back to basics, right? Eating clean diets, anti-inflammatory diets, you know, sleeping, drinking clean water, reducing stress, being in nature, being, you know, movement. And, and definitely here at A4M, this is what we always really is, I call it, logical and physiological medicine, right? We teach you root cause medicine and how to really connect all these dots and put the body together. Um, unfortunately in medicine, sometimes because we are becoming so subspecialized, that patient is so chopped up into so many ologists and subspecialties that, you know, we really kind of forget that this whole body system kind of talks together um, and communicate in, in really the brain does talk to the gut, the gut does talk to the heart, the heart talks to your skin, you know, gut disease, skin disorders, and so on. So um, this is really, and it's, it's fascinating, you know, honestly, I've been doing this for a very long time, you know, before this was um, not well documented in, in, in common literature, and really mainstream medicine. And now we're definitely seeing all these things we've been teaching really for the past 30 years at A4M, you know, finally making it into mainstream medicine and main, you know, studies and literatures and publications. So it's very exciting time, you know, honestly to be here. And as we all continue to redefine medicine at A4M. Absolutely. Well, we want to thank you both for joining us today. And of course, all of our Spring Congress presenters for being with us and sharing your insight, and of course, to all of our attendees for spending this Saturday with us, one final reminder that you can purchase the complete Spring Congress program from our library at the link on your screen and also located in the chat as well. One final reminder, so we've got some upcoming um, events that we would want to make sure that you've got on your calendar, of course. Um, so September 9th and 10th, the Pediatric Brain Health Summit will be held at the beautiful Terranea Resort in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. September 16th through the 18th, Bioidentical Hormone Replacement Therapy Symposium will be hosted at the Boston Park Plaza, so make sure you've got that one on your calendar as well. In October on the 28th and 29th, Four Chalation Therapy will gather at the Charleston Place in Charleston, South Carolina. And we close out this year, December 9th through the 11th with the 30th World Congress and Longevity Fest 2022 held in fabulous Las Vegas at the Venetian and Palazzo Resort. And today you can register for any of these in-person events by visiting a4m.com. We wanna thank you again for your participation today and we hope to see you in person this December. Mm -hmm.